Hey, thanks, Tom. Um, Mike, Tom just introduced you there as a developmental biologist. I, it always has seemed to me that you do developmental biology like no one else does. Um, I suppose the, the, the general question you seem to be uh, trying to address is how cells organize themselves and each other in time and space to form uh, to, to, to form distinct tissues and organs and organisms with specific body shapes. So really all the stuff between molecules and life as we observe it. And it's in that in-between space that something seems to happen that distinguishes living matter from other kinds of matter. Um, and I want to burrow down into that in what we talk about. But first of all, I wanted to ask you this. My sense is that you think there is something quite fundamental still missing from that picture of how we think about, or at least how we talk about life, something that we're not going to get at by just filling in more of the details, more of the fine molecular details. So <laughs> I want to ask, am I right in that? And briefly, if I am, what do you think that missing ingredient might be? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think that uh, to to start to answer that, let's let's go back to the first part of the question, which is what 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 do I think I'm really doing? And uh, I should say that uh, I think that um, developmental biology is uh, is a uh, an offshoot of what I think my fundamental interest is, which is that I think what I'm actually studying is mind or cognition in different embodiments. So so the reason that I'm so interested in developmental biology specifically is that. It's an amazing example where during the during uh, sometimes just a few days and sometimes a few weeks, you start off with something that people would call just physics or just chemistry. So some sort of quiescent oocyte. It's a single cell. It may not be doing very much. And, and after a very short time frame, you then have something like an organism that has preferences, ability to learn. Maybe it's, if it's human, eventually it will have the ability to use language to expound on why it's not a machine and all of these things that, that people talk about. And so that journey, each one of us takes that journey, right? From, 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 from physics and chemistry to complex mind. And, and, and there's, no, there's no hiding from, from that, right? To, to, the, to whatever extent we are cognitive creatures, we have an inner perspective, we have uh, various mental capacities, we were once just physics, all of us were, not just in an evolutionary sense, but really in a developmental sense. And you can watch it happen in front of your eyes. So from that perspective, I think developmental biology is, is uh, you know, it's why I switched from doing computation in, in, in sort of silicon medium to computation in living media. But I am fundamentally interested, not just in questions of cells and why they do things, but in morphogenesis or, or, or pattern formation as an example of the appearance of mind from matter. That's really right. To, to me, developmental biology is the most magical process there is because it literally in front of your eyes takes you from, from matter to mind. You can see it happen and that's what I'm interested in. And by that, I understand, I mean, this is um, the, the issue that uh, Tom mentioned of you, your notion that, and, and Dan Dennett's notion that life is cognition all the way down. And it seems clear you don't mean that as a metaphor, do you? You see a complete continuity between what single cells do and what large brained animals like us do. So where does that continuity come from? What, 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 is your, what, what do you mean by cognition in this sense? Yeah. So, so, so the first, the first point, you know, do I think it's a metaphor? Um, in a, in a strong sense, I think everything scientists do is a metaphor. So, so I think we have to be really careful not to believe that we have some things that are sort of real pictures of the world, like pathways that we see in our textbooks. I mean, these things are are as metaphorical as anything else, maybe more so. And then there are these metaphors that you know we sort of we sort of speak about that aren't really real. They're just fuzzy ways of talking. I don't I don't believe this. I think that um, in science, all we have are metaphors. Now, some metaphors are better than others. And the way that I like to judge metaphors is to what extent do they facilitate progress, meaning, meaning new capabilities, further experiments, right? A good metaphor is one that, uh, it's not necessarily one that doesn't break prior assumptions. It's not necessarily one that doesn't shock you. It, what, what it has to do is it has to uh, move you towards new experiments. And I think that from that perspective, uh, cognition all the way down is, is an absolutely excellent metaphor for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first is that it's been incredibly fruitful in generating new, new hypotheses, new experiments, new capabilities, um, including some that are reaching into biomedicine. We could, we could talk about that. But the, but the, reason, that, the reason that I think it's, it's inescapable is 
let's uh, is, is basically back to developmental biology instead of a lot of people start off right uh, you know they'll start off with a with a paramecium or or, a, or a, you know some kind of simple life form and they'll say look surely that's not cognitive surely that's just physics right and and I, I like to do it uh, in reverse I like to say okay what whatever humans have uncontroversially as high level cognition right so so if cognition means anything it, it's what we, we have it right otherwise it would just there's just no um, no, nothing to talk about. So, so whatever it is that we have, you can start with an adult human with all of this and just walk slowly backwards. And when you walk slowly backwards, you could do it evolutionarily too, but let's just do it developmentally. You, you, you walk slowly backwards and eventually you walk into a, uh, a small child that's, that's babbling and trying to understand the reference of language. And before that, you've got an embryo. And before that, you've got a single cell. And before that, you've got some chemical reactions. And so the important thing is that biology offers absolutely no bright line. There is no process at which you can say, that's where the lightning flash happened. Before that, it was just chemistry and physics. Ah, now we've got some cognition. There is, there is no, no point like that, that, that anybody, I mean, people have tried to draw lines like that. I've never heard of a convincing one. And so I think, I think uh, the way I would, I would sort of flip that question around is to say, if somebody, if somebody doesn't think there's a continuity, it's on them to specify what the discontinuity is, right? It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not that you have to defend the continuity. I mean, Darwin knew, he spoke about this very clearly. Um, the continuity is staring us in the face. It's the, it's the discontinuity that needs defending if somebody in fact thinks that there is, uh, there is a sharp break here somewhere. You just said something interesting. You said you could look at that process either in evolutionary terms or in developmental terms. Um, but I wonder, to what extent those are sort of equivalent ways of looking at it, because developmentally, there's um, this, we, we can argue about whether the notion of a program makes sense developmentally, but certainly there seems to be a target of sorts. There is something that you're going to end up with. In evolutionary terms, it's not at all obvious that that is the case. And I mean, it's normally said that it's not the case at all. There's nothing, you know, purposeful or directional perhaps about evolution. But I wonder if that's something, if that's a distinction that actually you want to challenge. How, do, how should we think about that process as being distinct or similar in evolutionary or developmental terms? Yeah, um, I, well, I actually, I actually have have written uh, one one paper with Chris Fields on uh, target morphology in evolution, and we can we can talk about that specifically if if people like. But but I want to go back to kind of um, the, the 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 really important thing that you just mentioned, which is having a target of some sort. One thing that uh, is really important, I, I think, one 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 thing that we have to do is we have to ask what do we mean by a cognitive system of some sort? Okay, so when I say it's cognition all the way down, what, are, what am I really saying? So this has been, this has been people, people have, have addressed this for, for, for a really long time. And I think we need to do two, uh, two interesting things. One is that we have to abandon a binary view of things. Binary views get us in trouble in this, in this case. If, we, if, if you try to say there are conscious systems and unconscious systems, there are cognitive systems, and then there are uh, just machines, there are you know, purposeful things, and then there are artifacts, those kind of um, distinctions are completely arbitrary. They are a result of, of past limitations of technology and imagination on our part. They, I don't believe they exist. And they get us into all kinds of pseudo problems where people have to make these Byzantine partitions and, and of, of things and try to figure out you know, where things land. What I think we have is a continuum where one has to ask not whether something is cognitive, but how much and what kind. So there's a continuum. So, so I've, I, lots of people ever since um, cybernetics in the 40s where, where uh, Norbert Wiener and, and colleagues uh, put out a, a, an example of a spectrum like this. I've got my own version, which is called the, uh, the spectrum of persuadability that we can talk about. But the idea is that it's a continuum. And along this continuum, there are diverse capacities for goal-directed behavior. The things on the left of the continuum have extremely small capacity for goal-directed behavior. So meaning that all they do is pursue energy gradients down and that's all they can do. These are balls rolling down a hill, water flowing down and, and, and things like this. All the way on the right are very, very clever things like humans, which can pursue uh, very complex goals using planning, using uh, like extensive memory, using all, all sorts of neat tricks that, that they have. In between this, we have we have a variety of other agents that may be uh, that may have a limited limited ability to pursue various goals. And I've the way I formalized it is as being able to for any for any creature, whether it be biological, synthetic, uh, software, engineered, alien, you name it. For any creature, you can draw something called a cognitive light cone. You can simply ask 
what is the size of the biggest goal that that creature is able to pursue? And when I mean biggest goal, I mean distance in both space and time. So for just to give you a simple example, if you're a tick, you've got uh, a little bit of memory going backwards, maybe a little bit of predictive capacity going forwards. I mean, even yeast have that, but really all you care about is your local concentration of butyrate and you're following the gradient. And that's pretty much all you're ever going to do. If you're a dog, you have a much bigger uh, horizon of memory going backwards. You have more predictive capacity going forwards, but you're never going to care about what happens in the next town over three weeks from now. Just can't be done with that as far as we know with that cognitive system. And if you're a human, you might actually be depressed that in some billions of years, the sun will burn out because you literally can care about these enormous things, very complex, large scale things like global, you know, world peace and the status of the markets and all this. So, so what you can, what the, the thing about that kind of scale is that it takes all of this away from philosophical uh, sort of arguments and down into experiments. Basically, we can actually find out, we can do experiments. What does that system, act, what is it able to exert work towards? What kind of states does it prefer? And how much, uh, uh, um, uh, how much competency does it uh, exhibit? For example, and you know, I forget who's, um, somebody had a great analogy and I forget who it was, but the, dis the difference between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together, right? The difference is how, what, what degree of, of, of ability to avoid local obstacles does the system have in doing it, right? It could be very simple. It could be very, very complex. And then, and then we, can, we can stop having philosophical debates about this and we can simply do experiments. And that means that if, if I show you some kind of a system, maybe it's synthetic, maybe it's a real animal, who knows? Uh, we can make hypotheses. You can say, I think the system lives at this uh, level of cognitive complexity and that's all. And, and somebody else might say, oh, you've missed the boat entirely. In this other problem space, it's way cleverer than you give it credit for. Here's my data, here's my experiment. And so then, then we, can, we can do experiments. And so now we can talk about goals. So uh, goals in development um, are uh, what, what, I've been, what I've been working on for years is to try to show how, how the developmental a system, and this, is, this includes development, regeneration, cancer suppression, all of these things, is very, very, uh, is, has, 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 has large capacity for navigating that space of possible configuration. We, we call it morphous space. It's the space of, you know, if you're going to make a head, there are many different shapes of a head, and there's this space of all possible configurations of a head. So what we've been, what we've been finding, and people have been describing this for hundreds of years, but I think not paying attention enough to this, is that these systems are incredibly capable of getting to the correct region of that space, meaning making the correct shape, despite all sorts of perturbations, novel scenarios that they've never seen before, evolutionary, no, evolutionary novelty. I mean, I can give you many examples. And so they have this amazing ability to navigate that space. And so, and so this is why I think of uh, collections of cells, as a, meaning tissues during development or regeneration, as collective intelligence is navigating a space, literally, again, no, no, no excess metaphors here, literally, uh, we, we can port all of the math and the insights that we use to study collective, uh, so, you know, swarm behavior and collective cognition to understand how cells work together on these massive goals. No individual cell knows what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective absolutely does. And the reason we know it does is because if you're a salamander, and some of your fingers are cut off, what will it do? It will regrow exactly the right number of fingers. And then the most magical thing of all is it stops when it's done. In order to stop when it's done, it has to know what the correct shape is. It has to know that the delta now is zero. The error is very low, now we can stop. So, so in development, there are absolutely goals like this. Uh, in evolution, I'm not sure, but I'm not willing to say it doesn't exist. And I think we need to do experiments. I think it's unclear actually whether that's true or not. I, I should say, by the way, for everyone listening, please do post your questions, which I hope you will have, and I'm sure you will have at any point in the chat, so that we're ready to go on to them um, at any moment. So don't, you know, don't wait for us before you, you pose them, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn to you to ask them in, in turn. Um, so, Mike, it, it sounds as though there's, um, th there's a kind of a tension here between the notion in development that there are these target morphologies, and you talk about that in terms of your work on, you know, planaria, for example, where they find their way, as you say, reliably and reproducibly to these target morphologies. A tension between that and the plasticity that we see in living form, that there are alternatives and we can reprogram whole organisms and we can reprogram cells. How, how does that balance play out? You know, to what extent do we have, or does nature have the ability to take a different path? And to what extent are those destinations predetermined? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, I, I think it's not so much attention as much as these are these two things are uh, exactly um, uh, 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 interdependent. And and so and so uh, the thing the thing is that evolution is is not playing with a passive medium where it has to micromanage all of the details and and sort of figure out where everything needs to go evolution is working with cells which themselves used to be independent organisms they have their own agendas they have um, uh, various pro uh, computations that they can do they have preferences and so what evolution does is a kind of behavior shaping really what evolution is really doing is pro is, is providing uh, various signals that get these complex creatures to meaning cells to do what it wants them to do. Evolution is hacking them the exact same way that bioengineers try to hack them and the exact same way that cells hack each other and the exact same way that parasites hack other organisms. This is all about figuring out um, what is uh, a level of control over the system that gets you the most bang for your buck. And what we've seen both as, as, as workers in regenerative medicine and bioengineers uh, and, and uh, it, just watching natural evolution the, the most efficient way to control something as complex as a collection of, of, of competent uh, uh, subunits like cells is not to try to micromanage it, is actually to take advantage of the large scale uh, cognitive capacities that these things have. As, as a very simple example, you know, what I, what I, I say this to my students is, look, if, if you've got a rat and you want the rat to do cir a circus trick, you've got two basic choices. You can micromanage it, meaning get in there and control every neuron, like a play the play it like a puppet. And that will take you, I don't know how many years if that's even possible to, to, to do that. Or you can just train the rat. And this is why human beings have been able to train animals for thousands of years before knowing anything about neuroscience. It's because, because complex um, systems expose interfaces, including uh, sensory systems, including um, uh, bioelectrics, which is what we study that allow high level controls. It allow you to operate not the way that we used to program in the 50s where you physically had to rewire things, but and, and the way that molecular medicine is, currently, uh, is, is, is certainly uh, done today, uh, but actually uh, at a much higher level by taking advantage of the intelligence of the system to operate at a higher level. And so what I think is going on here is that all of these systems, cells, organs, tissues, and so on, are navigating this, they're navigating these spaces. Now there are multiple spaces. So there's anatomical space, there's gene expression space, there's physiological space. They're navigating all these things. And uh, they have certain policies for navigating them, which include various preferences about what they wanna do and various competencies, things they know how to do and then things that stump and flummox them completely. And so absolutely there are multiple outcomes that can happen, but all of that is uh, by virtue of the, the way to understand that is not to try to uh, try to uh, build it up uh, at, at the very micro level, but rather try to understand what are, what are the policies that are guiding these decisions, and then how has evolution, an engineer, a parasite, or you know whatever it is, af uh, affected that landscape that now uh, it controls the way that that the system moves through that space. So so just you know as a simple example is our our, our xenobots, right? So so what we do is we, we, you know you ask um, what does the frog genome know how to do? Well, the frog genome reliably uh, um, makes a, a a tadpole that that lives in a froggy environment and it's very fit for that environment and and things are great. Well, it turns out that that actually is so and and so the skin cells of those animals are. Uh, a kind of a passive, boring two-dimensional layer that sit on the outside and keep out the bacteria. And you might think, well, that's what skin cells know how to do, and that's that. Well, it turns out that if you actually liberate those skin cells from the rest of the animal and put them on their own and give them a chance to re sort of re reboot their multicellularity, what you find out is that their normal two-dimensional passive life is just uh, the result of instructive interactions or, or, or re really a kind of uh, behavior shaping or, or, or bullying by the other cells. That's what they do when the other cells are making them do this. On their own, they do something completely different. They form a little creature known as a xenobot. It has autonomous motion. It has lots of other behaviors, including the ability to make new xenobots by running around and collecting loose cells, which it then packs into the new generation of xenobots. I mean, it's amazing. And that kind of thing has never existed uh, in nature to our knowledge before. It's certainly never been part of the frog life cycle. It's, it's a different way of being. It's a different um, uh, set of attractors in the space of possible morphologies and behaviors. And those cells are able to find that. That's, that's, that's massive plasticity. And yet in their normal environment, they will make a very good tadpole and a very good frog. And in fact, if you scramble the craniofacial organs of that, frog, of that tadpole, they'll, you'll still get a good frog because all the organs will move around relative to each other and land in the correct orientation and then stop. Right. So, so I think this, this ability to, um, that, that's the mark of a, of a, of a sophisticated navigational system is that, is that you, you can get around this space, but it, and, and you'll get to where you're, where you're going despite perturbations, 
but at some point you might need to go somewhere else and that's and these systems can absolutely do it i think i think that kind of thing potentiates evolution greatly evolution has the speed that it does exactly because of that mm -hmm. fantastic